Support comes from the Soraya at Cal State Northridge, presenting musician Anushka Shankar on October 22nd. The daughter of Ravi Shankar, Anushka celebrates her mastery of the sitar during her only stop in L.A. Learn more at thesoraya.org. Boston Court Pasadena invites you to the immersive world premiere of Measure Still for Measure. Embark on a roaming journey behind the curtain to experience the complexities of creating theater. Happening now through October 15th. Visit bostoncourtpasadena.org for tickets. LAS Studios. Hey, LA. If you have student loans, I have some bad news for you. Payments on those are going to start up again real soon. I'm Brian De Los Santos, and this is How to LA, the podcast that helps you navigate living in the city, and in this episode's case, just living. Today's topic, student loans. Loans were frozen back in 2020 as part of pandemic relief. Payments and interest have been on pause ever since, until recently. Interest on loans resumed in September, and repayments are starting again in October. A lot of borrowers have never made a payment, and some loans may even have changed servicers during the payment freeze. No doubt, there are a lot of questions. Like, wasn't there supposed to be loan forgiveness? What happened? And why do so many people have student debt in the first place? Today, we will try to get you some answers. We're talking with Corey Turner, NPR correspondent and expert in all things student loans, and LA's reporter Julia Barajas, who will explain the long, foul history of student loans in California and in the U.S. Up first, Corey Turner. Hey, Corey. Hey, Brian. All right, so first things first, because I don't have any student loans myself. I didn't qualify. Uh, You are lucky. (laughs) Yeah, well, I didn't qualify back then when I was in school. Um, Uh And this world is something that I know nothing about, honestly. So can you give me a quick breakdown about what's been happening with the timeline of loans this fall? Yeah, so the first things first, borrowers haven't had to make payments on their student loans for about three and a half years. So best case scenario, the vast majority of federal student loan borrowers, of which there are around 43, 44 million, they're out of practice, right? Um, But we know now they have to return to repayment. Bills are going to start coming due in October. Uh, interest started accruing the beginning of this month. And, you know, borrowers are coming back to repayment with uh, changes in all sorts of ways. The student loan system itself itself has changed. There's at least one new repayment plan that folks might not be familiar with. And then obviously three and a half years is a long time for any of us. Our own lives have changed. Our finances have changed. We might have changed jobs. We might have changed partners. Just a lot of uncertainty. So a ton of questions for somebody like me. Of course. And, you know, if we go back a bit to 2020, as you mentioned, you know, loans were paused and different loan forgiveness plans were on the table. That was because of the COVID-19 emergency. Right now, what's up with loan forgiveness? (laughs) I think generally think about when we talk about federal student loan forgiveness, this was President Biden's plan. He campaigned on to forgive between $10,000 and $20,000 of federal student loan debt for really just about every borrower in the system. So that's not happening, Brian. The Supreme Court shut it down. Uh, There has been talk by President Biden himself of trying to get at it a different way. I personally, as a reporter, I'm not putting much stock in that. And, and one reason, I think, is because I think folks need to get used to the idea that the system is coming back online. But I will say there's good news for borrowers out there who are still hoping for forgiveness. President Biden and his education department have been overhauling really troubled loan forgiveness programs like public service loan forgiveness. Um, there's technically loan forgiveness built into the income-driven repayment plan. Uh, these didn't work very well. Uh, in fact, NPR investigations uh, are one of the many reasons the Biden administration overhauled these forgiveness plans. They're much better now. And borrowers, I think, can really look forward to hopefully a better, fairer system when they do get back into repayment and hopefully some clarity on, you know, maybe they will qualify for forgiveness. 
I'm curious to know what are some of the stories you've heard from students or from borrowers uh, across the country? You know, what are their situations now? Here's the thing, Brian. I've kind of gone all in on covering student loans the last few months because I knew this return to a payment was going to be such a big deal. And what's really surprised me in the dozens and dozens of borrowers I've talked to is there is no one story. There is no typical story. You know, I've talked to borrowers who are 24, 25, 26 years old. They've never been in repayment, mm-hmm. right? So they have that that kind of jittery first date feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what website I need to go to to figure this out. I totally get that. At the same time, I had a, I had a really hard conversation with a, a borrower the other day who was in her mid 60s, who took out what are called parent plus loans to help put her son through college, realizing now that she has way more debt than she can really afford and won't qualify for forgiveness until she's in her mid eighties. And, and so it's just, it's, it's such a, an interesting dynamic, often painful spectrum of voices I've been hearing. And, you know, this, whatever I can do to help connect folks to at the very least answers. So you, you did write a story about this and you had some urgency for folks. If, if someone has loans right now and they have to start thinking about paying them, what is their first step? Yeah. So Brian, first things first, I'd say, you know, borrowers need to go to studentaid.gov, which is the, the federal government's website for federal student aid borrowers. They need to log in, just get reacquainted with their loans because interest started accruing September 1st. So with, whether or not they choose a repayment plan, the government has started charging them, all right? The clock is ticking. And the first bill is going to come due in October. So folks really need to choose a repayment plan, and they need to get moving. And I, I get that that borrowers are reluctant. Nobody really enjoys going online and figuring out their student loans, but they need to do it, and they need to do it now. All right, so let, let's say someone hops onto their loan portal and their initial suggested monthly payment is really, really high and they're scared. What are some of the options that are on the table for folks? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'd be curious if the monthly payment estimate is high because the system assumes right now, the system is going to assume that everybody wants to be in the traditional <laughs> repayment plan, which Brian like a lot of borrowers do not want to be in the standard plan because that's paying off your entire loan balance in just 10 years. All right. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I can never afford that payment. It's probably because it's assuming you want to be in the standard plan. I recommend folks look into what's called an income driven repayment plan and specifically the newest income plan. It's called save. All right. It is, it is all but guaranteed to offer almost all borrowers, a much more affordable monthly payment along with the promise of loan forgiveness after a set amount of time. Got it. And I'm, I'm bringing you this question because I'm in my you know early 30s. And at this point, my friends are either getting married, trying to buy houses or paying off these loans. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like this comes up in so many conversations about when am I starting to save for a house? And some of that transitions into like student loans and other debt. As I talk about this, I'm thinking about credit scores. How does, you know, student loans affect credit scores and what's that relationship like? That's a great question, Brian. And I and I think the way I want to answer it is by issuing a sort of blanket warning to borrowers. Uh, warning is not even the right word. But just uh, some really basic advice to borrowers. If you're having trouble with your monthly payment, the one thing I recommend you don't consider is default because default Mm -hmm. will destroy your credit. If you default on your federal student loans, it will make it hard for you to get an apartment. It will make it hard for you to get a car loan. The federal government, if you default on your loans, can garnish your wages. They can take your social security. They can take your tax refund, right? And the system the repayment system, especially with this new income-driven repayment plan, SAVE, it is more understanding of people's individual situations. But again, I would say to safeguard your credit, call your servicer. If you can't afford your monthly payment, there are options and they are all better than default. And I, I should mention, Brian, the one thing we haven't talked about really is that 
servicers right now are really overstretched. And if you try to call, you're likely to spend a lot of time on hold. And even when you get through, you might well get a call center worker who maybe knows less about the system at this point than you do. Congress refused to give the education department and its servicers any extra money to pay for this return to repayment. It's hard to hire new people if you can't afford to pay them or train them. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a mess. The next burning question I have is, what do folks need to pay attention to next? You know, any dates, announcements, things they need to be looking out for in your reporting? There's, there's one really big thing. Uh, and this is mostly for borrowers who've been in the system for at least a few years. So the borrowers who have never had to make a payment, this won't really apply to them. But this is a really big deal for most borrowers. It, and it's the Biden administration has been quietly working behind the scenes to do what it's calling a one-time account adjustment. It's unprecedented. About a year and a half ago, in part as a result of an NPR investigation, but there have been a lot of clamor from borrower advocates as well. There were just a lot of problems with income-driven repayment. And, and what that meant is a lot of low-income borrowers especially weren't being enrolled in these plans, so they weren't qualifying for that promise of loan forgiveness that we talked about. And so what the Biden administration is doing is they're basically going back through the records of every borrower, whether or not you were ever in income-driven repayment, whether or not you ever expressed any interest in it. And what they're doing is they're basically giving borrowers back credit for months they were in repayment or maybe they were in forbearance or even some kinds of deferment. And all of this back credit now will count towards that loan forgiveness promise that comes with being in an income-driven repayment plan. And so you're seeing one of two things happening right now, which is really, it's it's kind of fun to watch. It happened to me the other day. I, I was online with a borrower doing an interview as she logged into her account and suddenly realized her loans were gone. They'd been erased oh. overnight and she didn't even know why. And it was because she had been in the system for 20 years. She hadn't been in an income driven plan. But again, because the Biden administration was doing this one time account adjustment saying, look, you probably should have been in this plan, but we know the system didn't work. So we're going to give you credit for it. And lo and behold, they just erased her loans. So my advice to borrowers, this is happening right now and it's ongoing. Lots of folks are going to find like they'll get three extra years of credit, four extra years of credit. It's a big deal. And they'll get notified in the coming months by their service. That was Corey Turner from NPR. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, Corey. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brian. Next up, we'll be talking with LA's reporter, Julia Barrajas, to get some background on why student loans even exist in the first place and California's role in that. All of that after this short break. Celebrated sitar player and musician Anushka Shankar arrives in L.A. on October 22nd, performing at the Soraya at Cal State Northridge, taught to play the Indian classical instrument by her father, the legendary Ravi Shankar. Anushka has risen to become one of the most acclaimed musical artists in the world today. This will be her only stop in L.A. on her North American tour, fresh off the release of her latest album. Tickets are on sale now. Learn more at thesoraya.org. Boston Court Pasadena wraps its 20th anniversary season with the world premiere of Measure Still for Measure, written and directed by co-founding artistic director Jessica Kubzanski. This play within a play takes you on an immersive roaming journey behind the curtain to experience the layered and intimate complexities of creating theater. Happening now through October 15th. For tickets and more information, visit bostoncourtpasadena.org. And we're back with Julia Barrajas. Hey, Julia. Hey, Ryan. So we just spoke with NPR correspondent Corey Turner, and we were talking about what borrowers need to know when student loan payments start again in October. After hearing all the stories and tips he had to share, I was just wondering, how did we even get here? I took a look at that myself. I was really curious about how student debt even became a thing. So last year I wrote a story about this, and what I found is that student debt really is rooted in public policy. I would recommend that we take a look at student debt on a timeline starting right after World War II. 
that's when the federal government was really starting to emphasize access to higher education for a larger number of people. And then in the 60s, around the Civil Rights Movement, Congress also passed the Higher Education Act. It paved the way for things like federal student loan programs, which we're familiar with today, work study, and also the federal Pell Grant that comes from taxpayers to help students from low-income families. Then in the 80s, it was that after Congress made all these things like the GI Bill, the, uh, the Pell Grant, all that stuff, uh, in comes Ronald Reagan, right? And then President Reagan was not a fan of a lot of things, including higher education. And so there was a lot of cuts, basically, to uh, social spending programs, including higher ed. Let's chill on that for a minute. Let's talk about funding for higher education, which actually it started in the 40s. It ramped up in the 60s. And like you said, it got slashed by Reagan later on. What happened in the 90s where there's less funding for education? So what's really interesting is that funding gets cut, right? But then around in the 90s, Decisions are made and so that um, something called the um, parent plus loans, um, all of a sudden you can use them to cover the entire cost of your child's education. And this is going to be kind of like in the weeds a little bit, but please stay with me. Um, because the reason why that matters is that like, these loans, first of all, they're not subsidized. So that means that the second you get them, you pay interest. And that's different from other loans that are available to students that like they can wait up until after they graduate to start paying them back. For parents, the second you get them, you're going to be accruing interest. The cost of college since the 90s hasn't just grown, it has skyrocketed. I think the according to the Education Data Initiative, tuition and fees have jumped by 130%, and that's after adjusting for inflation. And we got to think about how this is an education system. It's not just one or two stories. There are many stories involved in this, right? I'm so interested in, in this in this part of your story that you actually called out California's contribution to increasing student debt in your article. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, so that, again, a lot of things in history go back to Ronald Reagan. And before he was president, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, became Cal- uh, the governor of California in the late 60s. And when he did, he was calling for two things. One, he wanted to remove a guy named Clark Kerr. Um, and he was the president of the University of California and a champion of free tuition. That was a very big thing for him. The second thing that uh, Governor Reagan wanted was to start imposing tuition on UC students. So back in the day, you could go to like UCLA, UC Berkeley, pretty much for free. Um, and then so these uh, tuition uh, fees got imposed. They grew and grew over time. And they continue to grow today. So talking about money, where does the money go that borrowers are paying a lot of people are making good money off of students. Uh, one of them is our federal government. Mm-hmm. So almost all of the the loans in terms of that trillion dollar plus debt that we have hanging over the country, most of that money is owed to the federal government. And it's worth highlighting that the government does profit from student debt. And specifically, it does it by charging more interest than it needs to in order to run the programs. But, and that money is not necessarily going back into like federal student aid programs or anything like that. It just goes into the general budget. Wow. So it's like a system that keeps on going and going. I do want to take a moment to talk to you about the folks you spoke with. They're first-generation students. They're teachers. They were students at the time you did your reporting. As I mentioned to Corey earlier, I didn't qualify for loans because I was undocumented as a student back in the day. And so I don't have that debt. I'm not quite sure how that journey is as a borrower. But can you share what these folks told you? So everyone I interviewed was a first-generation student. That's where my interest was. Most of them were from working-class backgrounds. And like you mentioned, a lot of them are teachers, they're social workers, just people who tend to be in public service. Many of them were not just the first to graduate in their families from college. They were the first to go to high school, right? They were sometimes the first to go to middle school. And what they told me is that a lot of them got grants and scholarships. Some of them were like hardcore nerds and they got like the Bill Gates scholarship. Which is huge, by the way. Yeah, huge, huge, huge. And that still sometimes was not enough. So all of them worked at least part-time. Often they worked full-time. Sometimes they worked more than one job, sometimes more than two jobs. But the important thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people were making payments. And because of interest, you keep making payments, but it doesn't go down. So tell us why all of this really matters. College was often sold to students as a ticket to the middle class, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, if you just go to college, 
you're gonna get a, a, a decent paying job and you'll live a decent life maybe you won't be rich but you'll you'll live comfortably we i i really bought into that and so you think of college as something that like the investment is worth it and so when you graduate and you have those loans and the job's not there it can be tough and it's especially tough because women and people of color tend to earn less than their white male counterparts like over over time so that's one thing but the other thing too is that the college grads from working class backgrounds are going to start off their adulthood in debt Mm -hmm. so you you think about the role that interest plays in this that means these students are kind of being taxed to get higher ed and they're the students who like stand to benefit the most and a lot of times you're making these decisions when you're like a child you might be 17 18 you know like in little mermaid when ariel like signs off her soul to ursula yes kind of like that yeah (laughs) something like that So before I let you go, I do want you to put your expert hat on and tell me what would you like to see change in this education system we have now? Um, I spent about, I think, three weeks interviewing like six people per day minimum for over an hour. And I, I bring that up because it was like hearing the same story over and over. And so some of the things that would be great, one is that if college wasn't so expensive, right? And we know that the UC Board of Regents here in California, is working to make school debt-free by 2030. That that could be huge. I think another important thing that we talked about is just, like, how demoralizing it is to, like, be paying monthly on time and seeing that interest go up. I think it's worth asking ourselves if taxing, essentially taxing students to go to college is fair. So, yeah, working to make a college more affordable, re-examining the role of interest, And I think we talk about this too as encouraging students to like think of college as something for themselves, not to, I don't know, please other people. I'll just be transparent. When I was in high school, like people talked about community college, like if it was the worst thing that could happen to you, right? Like you failed in life, which is like just one, really, really ignorant and two, pretty disgusting there are people who go to community colleges for a variety of different reasons a lot of professors who work really hard to provide quality education and it is a great stepping stone into if you want to pursue higher ed or maybe into like a well-paid trade right so like when you are 17 or 18 and there are all these adults giving you advice be kind to yourself and you know ask a lot of questions and if it still doesn't make sense ask the same question again you deserve to have that information Thanks to Corey Turner and Julia Barajas for speaking with us today. We'll have Julia's story and the website Corey mentioned linked in our show notes. If you thought this episode was helpful, please hit subscribe and give us a rating. It's always appreciated. That's it for us today. Have a great week and see you soon, LA. This episode was produced by Victoria Alejandro. Our other team members are Megan Motel, Evan Jacoby, Monica Bushman, and Erica Washington. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes LA a better place to live. Awe, fascination, wonder. Join us for a week of stories from people who transport us to astonishing places. The word parasite evokes for me this beautiful netherworld of organisms that most people are unfamiliar with, that exist just under the surface of everything that's familiar. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Join me on point for a week of wonder to explore what captivates our minds, illuminates our shared humanity, and delights the soul. Five episodes, one each day. Listen and follow On Point wherever you get your podcasts.